And we're live. Welcome to the ASP.NET Community Stand-Up. I'm John Galloway. I'm a PM on the .NET Community team. Today, I'm super happy to have with us Scott Hanselman and Mark Downey. Hello. And yeah, so we're here to talk about 20 years of ASP.NET. It's been, we just celebrated the 20 year uh, anniversary of .NET overall. And, and uh, I thought it'd be fun to just kind of chat about ASP.NET, so. Yeah, <clears throat> I, uh, I was looking online. I started my blog in 2002 and I'm trying to find the date that I switched it over to ASP.NET. It started out at a website called Radio Userland. Oh, that wow. was one of the early blogging engines. And uh, I remember when Clemens Vasters at New Intelligence, Clemens Vasters works at um, in the Azure division now, but he worked at a company called New Intelligence. I think he actually started the company and wrote Das Blog, which is German for the blog. <laughs> das Boot. And, um, and uh, you know, I've always thought, yeah, maybe I'll just go to WordPress or whatever. But uh, it's just really nice to to work on your own lightsaber. So I've been kind of working on that thing. And then um, dot, uh, DOS blog, I think I was sitting on .NET 4 for the longest time. And then I discovered Mark and his genius. And uh, <laughs> and Mark, how, when did you find DOS blog and how did you start using ASP.NET? Oh, you're muted, sir. You think I've heard after two years of this, but no, apparently. <laughs> you would think after the panini going on this long that we would know. I do it every day, every day. Uh, yeah, so I started blogging in about 2005. I was on Live Spaces, and Live Spaces was just on the on the verge of being canned. And um, I was very frustrated by the idea that I'd kind of spent so much energy putting all these words out there, trying to, I, I think of the idea of kind of blogging as a, ability to kind of consume material. If I can explain it, I can pretty much, I can have some mastery of it. And so I was kind of frustrated by that kind of moment. And I was saying, well, I want to have complete control over it. And how do I do that? Not by joining another live spaces version, but by controlling it from, you know, as close to the ground up. So I was then looking, I think the choices at the time were subtext and maybe DOS blog. And DOS, the idea of DOS blogs was a little bit more compelling to me personally uh, because of the XM everything was XML right um it was XML configuration XML was those it, back in that day it was Jason Jason today and four years ago that's how we felt about XML back then everything <laughs> has to be Jason right uh, and so XML was the thing so configuration was Jason blogs were in Jason format sorry in XML format and that kind of was the very opposite of where I was. I don't know what format Life Spaces was. I don't know how they were storing it or mm -hmm. where. And it was the exact opposite. I had complete control. And there was it was the code was available for me to look at, download, jump into, learn from. And that's basically how I got, got started. Yeah, it was the first time that it wasn't hidden from me. That was the same reason I liked it as well. Right. Not related to ASP.NET, but just the openness of it. Like, oh, where are your blogs? They are in those text yeah. files. And there were early times when we would mess up and we would corrupt something, you know, in the early days. And we would just open up the XML file and go, oh, I, I see where I made a mistake there. And then I could go and look at that XML file. So that was very nice to do. And then you're right. Like you see, I don't know, so I, I was doing open source already, but for some reason, this was the first really large open source I'd done. And it was like, I can make actual changes to this and help my daily life. And it was the 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 cycle even now like yeah. you and i'll make a change or you'll you'll do something and update it and i'll put it live in production i'll be like ah oh, we did that that's yeah. better now yeah 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 it's interesting what you're saying there with like <clears throat> the over time with asp.net and with web in general like i guess thinking more of the web in general but we had like early on the web was like you know tiny little hosters and your ftping things and then Right around the time when blogging was taking off, that's around the time also when there's all these big hosted services and you had these big blogging platforms where some of the early like hosted services, but like you're saying, Mark, it's like you didn't have access to the code. You didn't have access to the files. Something gets taken offline. You're just out of luck. You grab some RSS and hope for the best, you know, right. but so having that whole control of it, that's, that's really a big part of what DOS blog offered, right? Exactly. I felt like uh, after a while, you felt like you were planting um, a garden or food in somebody else's 
on somebody else's property. Like, like anything could happen at any time that would render all that work you did um, um, invalid or, or use, useless. So I was like, I wanted to kind of really claim some of the control. And then open source was in its really nascent. I don't even know where this was hosted. Do you remember where I this was I think we were hosted? at SourceForge. Oh, God, OK. <laughs> right. And and there was a volunteer. There was a non. I, I need to look his name up. There was a gentleman who was a non-technical gentleman who wanted to help desperately, and he um, did our docs. He wow. made docsblog.info, which I think is gone. Yeah, he has. I it think has. his name was here. It is Tom Watts. We were on. Wow. We were on. We moved to Codeplex, and we were using Subversion. And I have an email from him in 2008 here where he went and made dosblog.info and he was our community manager. Wow. So that was a really, that was my first opportunity. Now, what is that now? Uh, 14 years ago to see a non-technical person take a leadership role. Let me rephrase a non-coding person, mm -hmm. right? Cause if yeah. you're talking about hosting your own blog engine, you're technical. So we should, we should catch ourselves saying non-technical. He was a non-coder who was a huge part of it. And and that's an, that sounds like a not controversial thing to say, but it's good to remind people that you could be a non-coder and be a huge, mm -hmm. huge part of it. He was registering our domain. He was managing our docs. He was doing tickets. He was setting up the website and doing documentation. So uh, it was it was a very vibrant community uh, back in 2005, six, seven, eight. I'm looking at I, my, I have every email going back 20 years. I love that you're calling that out. And I, I've been happy to see, like, including like Microsoft Docs and Learn and stuff embrace that too, accepting pull requests. And it, it makes me really happy to see like any page on the docs, you know, and then see people. Um, I'm thinking too of the .NET website now is localized with uh, Japanese and simplified Chinese. And it's cool that people can submit things and review in their own native language as well and stuff. So. I've noticed, uh, Mark, that uh, you're getting pull requests now. Like I felt like for a couple of years there, it was just you and then me right. and every once in a while. But now it seems like DOS blogs starting to pick up. Folks are getting involved. And um, I, I've been del very deliberate about identifying items that I think folks who are new just to open source generally in ASP.NET, maybe secondarily, would would gravitate to and find a way to kind of onboard. So I've been really, in, I, th I thought that's just kind of important part of a healthy community is kind of allowing folks in to the space, especially the parts that, that are manageable and, and bite-sized. So there's always one or two kind of um, bite-sized things. I, I deliberately ask the community to leave for, for folks who are relatively new and we give them a chance to kind of, I'll, I'm happy to kind of take time and kind of help step them through. We have docs that I think are, are kind of accessible. And yeah, the, the contributions from the community over the years have kind of picked up and become more varied. At first, we had hard code developers joining because they saw a, a really interesting problem. And as we kind of smooth the edges out, what we've been able to do now is present folks with opportunities to onboard and get used to a, a project in a, in a, that, of this size. Do either of you want to um, share your screen, show any code that you've been working on? So we've got a lot of coders watching. Sure. I mean, I, do you want to go first, Mark, or what do you? I can I can show. I don't I don't want to take away your your shine. No, no, please, please, please go ahead. Go go right ahead. I'll I'll set mine up here. All so, right. So while he's you. setting up, let me uh, do a couple of things here. So this will just be a little bit of context. So to start out, I've got. You know, Hanselman.com, which is a top level brochureware. You know, a lot of people have. So my my site's different from Mark's, which is great. And that's what's nice is that they look very different. So here's my top level domain. Then I've got Hansel Minutes, which is the podcast. And then I've got slash blog. And slash blog is a separate web app. So I have three different apps. And if you scroll down to the very, very bottom, this is really cool. This is something Damien Edwards did that uh, I put on all my sites and we've got in DOS blog. Um, I want to put it into DOS blog directly, but basically you can see that it says the version of .NET Core that I'm running. That's the runtime. And it has live in production, the actual commit hash and the specific build. So you can see that my situation is I haven't deployed since November of last year. So. I've got you know a year a year plus old 
DOS blog while Mark's is on a newer version. I'm on .NET 3.1 because I want my blog to be very, very stable. So right now, Mark's website is the uh, is the guinea pig, but because uh, I don't want this blog to go down. But if I go to Hanselman.com, which is a Razor Pages website, and we go down to the bottom of that, you can see that that's actually running on 601, right? So I'm more willing to let the homepage, ironically, be silly and be crashed mm -hmm. than. Uh, but if you look over here on the podcast, here's 601, that's running on. Uh, January of 2022. So just, just last month, I deployed that website. And then I can actually click on that and go directly to the commit. What did I specifically change? And I think that's a really cool thing to do in production. And I know that the folks like Nick Craver over at Stack Overflow, when they're logged into Stack Overflow as admin, they can see stuff that we can't see. Now, I've got this set up as public, but I always thought it was cool that we should kind of standardize on websites that tell you extra information. Like mm -hmm. I always felt afraid. I've talked to Mark about this, that my website was somehow unstable and we would go, what version's in production? And I was like, I don't, I don't really know. Like, I can't, when did we do that? I don't know. So we searched for Hanselman, Git, commit Azure DevOps. I always put Hanselman in front of all of my, uh, <laughs> my, my searches. Uh, adding a git commit hash and build number to an ASP.NET website. And the magic here is just a nice clean razor page with the link at the bottom, but you have to get the git hash and the build number out of the thing. You can get the build information, excuse me, the runtime information at runtime. But what, what Damien did is he tunneled the git hash into the assembly. So we've actually stamped the, the thing with the version directly. And you can actually do that right here on a .NET build command line. You say .NET build, source revision ID, and put in whatever you want. And we're just using the Git hash. And then storing that Git hash and available. Uh, so then that's now sitting at the bottom of my website. And then, of course, if I wanted to make that more private, I could make it so I was logged in as, as, uh, as admin before I could see it. So right now, I'm on 3.1. And if we go to the .NET website, and I hit download, and we go and look at all .NET versions, we can see that that is an LTS or a long-term support version. And I'm skipping five. And I believe Mark has got his running on six. So then I'll be able to jump from LTS to LTS, which will be really, really nice. While you're there, you can scroll to the bottom of that page itself, and it'll show there running oh, okay. on .NET 6.0.2. Look at that. So the .NET website itself is, po is is on 6.02. That's a great point. Now, um, oh, this, oh, hang on one second. There's a good point here. Someone in the chat has said, is, this a, is it a security risk making the exact, exact version public? Probably. It depends, right? That's why I made that comment about maybe only showing that if you're logged in as, as admin. Mm -hmm. But I do want to point out, though, that if you'll notice on my, my main website, on Hanselman.com, one of the things that's interesting is at the very bottom, oops, forgot to go to the right website. The very bottom, oh, actually wrong website, uh, Hanselman is to, to do. Having three websites with three different versions <laughs> is a little bit confusing. I've got doo, 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 a runtime version. Where, did it, where was it? It was like three point, oh shoot. It was 601. No, I've lost it. One eight. Yeah. So I am running on platform as a service on Azure. So this is actually auto updating. So I'm not applying security updates. I'm letting Azure do that for me. Mm. And this is the difference between deploying it into a virtual machine or deploying it into an Azure app service or a platform as a service system. So I just go into Azure portal and I say, I want it on .NET LTS and it's applying the security patches for me. Now, if you were doing self-contained builds, then yes, it would be even worse. So there might be a uh, zero day that could potentially hit me. Um, and yes, I'm perhaps advertising here. Um, I could, if I wanted to very easily change that to just show minor version or just major version. But I, I, I personally try to be a little more bit transparent, but thank you for that, that very good question there, hungry for apples. It depends is the answer. <laughs> well, it's interesting too. I like, I'm, I think for a small enough thing like this, you can kind of just 
you know, right click deploy or command line deploy or whatever, but you could, you could automate a good amount of this stuff too with, um, with GitHub actions potentially too, right? Well, we're using, I'm using Azure DevOps and I've got this all automated. Uh, okay. Mark, are you building yours? Where are you building your uh, dashboard? Yes, yeah. Azure DevOps. And if I get, if, you know, we do a new rollout, a new, uh, taking new PR, I, I straight to production. Nice. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So here's good. here I can actually go directly into Azure DevOps, see specifically which version of .NET got installed, and I can also run the tests in the cloud. It could easily work in GitHub Actions. We're just on Azure DevOps because it it works great. So why uh, why move? There's a question if you're using Razor components in your app. Are we using Razor components? I will defer to Mark on that, and we can look at the code if we need to. Yeah, let's dive into. Uh, so, I think for some areas we are. So, if you go look at some themes, I think you could maybe look at the layout. Uh, so here's the main layout. Here's partials. Yeah. So we We've yeah, got these. right here. Razor components or dot razor files, right? It's been mm -hmm. a while. Oh, yeah. Razor. Okay. Actually, no. No. What is the difference between the because there's because we're using partial views, but Razor components are a very specific thing. We're yes. more of a tag helper group, as mm -hmm. I recall. Yeah. So Razor there's there's Razor components are part of Blazor, right? Are they not? The, yes and no. You can use Razor components in Razor pages, and I think the idea is more. It's similar to a partial, but the workflow is a little different. And when I've when I've looked at them, it's more for things that you would include on multiple pages in an application, and a lot of it has to do with how they work with the workflow and what kind of state they need. Yeah, we, we didn't go with Razor then. I do not see any ra any dot Razor files yeah. here. Everything here is a CSHTML, and they're done as either partials like these, which mm -hmm. are very yeah. clean. So here's an open graph partial. So if I go here and say open graph. Where did our open graph go? My search is failing me. Uh, look Underscore. in views and maybe shared. Oh, there it is. Thank you, sir. So here's our open graph. It's just a little snippet, right? That's a that's a partial. So there's no uh, there's no component stuff there, you know, because a component would include C sharp and HTML and so like just some state. Um, but then. Later, we have a bunch of tag helpers. Here we're using the environment tag helper. And then if we go down deeper into like blog items, here's some of the great stuff that Mark has done around like comments or when I need an edit to a, a link to edit a post. I used to go and manually type that in and I would have a helper to go like a href and then I'd call a function. We've got all of that in a tag helper now. Could that have been a razor component? Yeah, maybe, I guess. I don't know. And, and, and then to, to that point, to the right of that, um, we came up with this idea of authorized, actually just right within the tag helper itself, you'll see post edit link, and then the next words are oh, dust blog authorized. Yeah, that was, yeah. Um, now this basically says, I only want to show this. Now, to be sure, the actual endpoint that it points to is actually secured as well, so you can only use it if you're authorized, but I actually only want to show the link if I am actually authorized to do so if I'm logged in as myself and I then have permission obviously to edit so we wanted to kind of have this idea which was again part of the original dust blog this idea of whether you are um, logged in or not and I wanted to kind of transfer that in a, in a kind of more contemporary sense wanted to kind of look at that same idea but how would how would we do that with a essentially what is an ASP.NET MVC app yeah tag helpers are so powerful and yeah. it's it's funny like you're saying there's there's different, you kind of pick one and go with it. Um, tag helpers though, uh, we, there's a lot of them used. I've contributed a little to the .NET website and there was something I needed to do recently where I needed to show something when you moused over something on the community page, mm -hmm. um, it was it's for the events, upcoming events yeah. and conferences. And there's a little info tag and we want it to be like accessible and all that kind of stuff. And I started looking around and thinking, okay, how am I going to do this? And then I, on a hunch, I looked and there was already a tag helper for this. Yeah. And it already worked with the bootstrap That's... classes and it was already accessibility checked and it was already well, used in the download page. So I'm like, boom, <laughs> pop it it's in. It's funny that you mentioned that the way that you said, I went looking and there was already one for it. Uh, mm -hmm. 
with with all due respect to my friend Mark, I, I have to say that he went absolutely ham <laughs> and like thought he drank deeply of the tag helpers religion. I am all in on tag helpers. <laughs> he, he's fully in, you know what I mean? Uh, so yeah, if you uh, <laughs> uh, there's this joke my wife and I always tell where if somebody goes like <clears throat> and they kind of clear their throat, you you go lozenge. But Mark's answer for everything is tag helper. So like whatever <laughs> problem we have, it's the tag helper that can solve that problem. If you clear your throat, don't be don't be un, uh, don't be surprised if Mark will not give you a tag helper. What's cool about that though is look, if the if you're thinking about a thing in DOS blog, there's a tag helper that does it. So look, post to Twitter tag helper, right? So that's a perfect one. Now it, it might look like a lot, but if you zoom out for a second, don't look at the code, just get a sense of the vibe. Not counting curly braces, it's maybe two dozen lines of code. And what's nice about it is that you're putting together a clean, clean component. You say, I want post to Twitter and it handles it. And what that means is that if Twitter changed their API, Mark changes it in one place and everybody who uses it, they don't change their markup and everybody wins. So what we did is we went through, there it is, post to Twitter. Look how clean that is. You're just making your own tags. And, and that, what I think is funny as a bunch of old people, uh, is that's what was so great about web forms, right? Web forms was like, oh, there's a control for that. There's a control for that. Yeah. But if you love HTML, but you love the idea of a component, you know, a web component, tag helpers are just so, so wonderful for that. It's really nice too, because you know, thinking about like Razor class libraries and then partials and all that, controlling having the state available for the component to work it can, is sometimes a little difficult, you know, and you need mm -hmm. to make sure, okay, is it provided by the controller or is it, you know, whatever with a tag helper, it's so simple because they're just properties in the in the markup that you're just passing along. And it's like that's you know, that's the state that's required for the yeah. tag helper to work. Oh no, look at this, Mark. What is that? Do you Oof. remember this? <laughs> so, what do we do? Okay. Do we so do? remember how your website and my website look different, right? They're mm -hmm. fundamentally different. Yeah. And I have this weird notion of I'm on the home page. Mm. Remember? Yeah. And it's like I don't want to show comments. And I had a bug where you'd go to my website and you'd be mm -hmm. scrolling and I was showing the comments. Mm -hmm. So we had never changed this partial here to tell, am I on the homepage uh, or am I on a deep link? Yeah, we so should put then, a for that. Have you I ever written some code that you <laughs> hoped you would not die and it would, they would dig it up and put it on your tombstone? <sighs> this is awful. I should not be digging around in here. And I remember writing the to-do. That's uh, some some context. We should come up with a way to tell, like, you know, am I on the mm -hmm. homepage? So I think I remember showing you this and... Uh, you're you 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 still talk to me, so hopefully I haven't offended you. <laughs> but but you know this is the thing, right? This is kind of uh, downshifting. Like yeah. he's you've made everything work in automatic, but sometimes I have to drive stick shift. <laughs> and uh, I went digging around into uh, the context, and I never actually fixed that. So forgive me. Can, can you dig in one of the theme on one of the themes here? Oh, um, just the themes kind of, are such yeah, a great talk, point. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah. Talk to me about themes. So, so Prince, in, in, again, DOSBlog historically had this idea of themes. So folks would develop their themes because they wanted DOSBlog to look the way they wanted it to look, right? Obviously, I mean, my if you look at my blog right now, it looks fundamentally different to Scott's. Mm -hmm. um, but this idea, we kind of wanted to make sure that kind of same idea was you, you could get started. It would be a simple layout. You could contribute to it, change, um, change and see how you ha kind of have it reflect your particular style. So think, we try to make themes as simple as possible. What are the fine, kind of overall layout of your page? What does a single page look like? And then also, what does your home page look like? And um, uh, yeah, see how, my see how fundamentally different it is, right? Yeah. It's you, it's it's yeah. unidentifiably. DOS blog. That's a thing we wanted to have total yeah. control about. Yeah. So from so, a code perspective, I wanted you to be able to have a layout, which would kind of say what the overall theme of your your um, your site was. You would have be able to customize it with CSS and JSON. Uh, sorry, and and, and uh, JavaScript. And then so that kind of represents the overall of your page. Your you know menu items. Your footer um that might be shared across your entire site and then in addition to that you'd have a blog item 
And the blog item would have a title of the blog post. You'd be looking at your page. You would have a body. And the essentially, all the work we did with Tag Helpers would allow you to quickly construct a page. So you could say, this is the title. This is the body. This is the, you know, this is the category list of categories of this particular blog post. I could edit. I can delete. I can create. Uh, I can I can see the created date of the post. All these were supposed to be established, so you don't have to worry about how I'm going to pull this data into my page. It's all done via Tag Helpers. Yeah, and then you see how this line 26, where he says DOS blog authorized, hides. You can imagine it folds up this div. So the edit, delete, and comment management links don't even render. That div won't even render if it's not been authorized by DOS blog. So you get to write the admin the same as you write the, the page itself, which is which is super nice. So he's got this, this folder structure here. If we go and look at that structure, I hired a designer named Jin Yang. And Jin uh, is the same designer who designed Stack Overflow. Um, and this is the default one. I have a Jin Yang custom theme here that's not checked into source checked into uh, the main source control and and then mark set his own separate theme as well and what's cool about this is that it's scoped so if i choose not to have a custom blog item razor page it falls back to the shared one so you can have uh, as little or so it's basically cascading layouts not just cascading style sheets mm -hmm. yeah uh, hungry for apples is asking if the code is publicly available of course this is open source my friends this is open source. You can go up to GitHub slash pop a string. And under repositories, we've got DOS blog core. Yep. Look at that. We've got like the venerable DOS blog. Yeah. DOS blog logo from back in the day. There's docs. You can show docs. There's um, deployment instructions if you want to put this on your local host, or if you want to deploy it to app services for Linux really cheaply, um, app service for Windows, Windows, we have instructions there as well. Um, editing and setting up your, your, your security settings and configuring the site itself so it's more custom. I even go into a little bit of the theming that I've mentioned here and what kind of, how you can uh, describe, um, if you go to under uh, the wiki, actually down, yeah. On the wiki. Uh, go, wiki. Here we go. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So why we did it on the right hand side, you see some instructions on some of the guiding principles, designing a theme. Um, we've got some things that are coming. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's how it is. Look at that. Ah, right. So yeah, the layout kind of represents the construct of the pay of the of the entire site. The the blog page itself is kind of there's a one to one relation between blog page and blog item when you're sitting on an individual blog post, but when you're sitting on your home page, there could be multiple pages referenced there. So that's kind of basically the, the theme I yeah. kind of copied from the DOS blog era. And actually a good a good thing to point out is this here. I was running my my website on a virtual machine at a host on Windows 2003 and then Windows 2008. And now I'm running in a container in Linux and the code 40% Maybe 50%? Mm -hmm. How much of the code is still the same? Like the runtime yes. part of the code is probably at least half the code, let's say, is the same code from 20 years ago running on Linux. How did you do that? So, yeah, if we can jump back to the code a little bit here. Um, so we decided oh, 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 yeah, we decided that to make sure to preserve as much of the goodness as possible. So if we look at the kind of folder structure, if you collapse your folder structure just for a second, the very last one, that project there, is me literally lifting and shifting from the .NET 1.1, you know, version of wow. code that essentially didn't even change when we upgraded to .NET 4, lifting and shifting and pushing it into DOS Blog Core. And that essentially is, there's a few things that are changed, but essentially at its heart, it's unchanged and it is, um, you know, um, it, it's 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 essentially unchanged. So you'll see things like collections, you'll see things like... Yeah. Um, <laughs> this, this is, is pre-generics, generic. right? This is pre-generics. Pre pre yeah. right, when right, you say right. .NET 1.1, it's important. It's not .NET Core 1.1. This is .NET. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> this is both a good thing and a bad thing. So yeah. Mark and I are in a situation where it works great. The site doesn't go down very often. It's very reliable. 
but this was pre-generic. So we don't have a list of mm. comments. We have a comment collection. And I actually wrote a code generator to make those. So, you know, a lot of this code is not what you would call idiomatic. Right. It's, it's really just, you know, before we could have, before we had um, generics, you would have to go and auto generate these things with code generators. So there's hundreds of lines of just awful stuff, but it works very well. So we don't touch it. Yeah. So, so this, all, all of the control of, I have a blog post, I'm submitting it to you. I am going to save that blog post to an XML file. I'm going to serialize it to a, to a, to a, to a file. That kind of part there is exactly the same. Yeah. Um, the, the only things we had to really contend with, and, and I think Scott will speak to this, is dealing with what a file path looks like on a Linux machine versus what it looks like on a Windows machine. Because we were bound by IIS up until .NET Core, right? And yeah. so files were going to be whatever the Windows system files were. And then when we came with .NET Core, we said, well, we can actually be anywhere. <laughs> so what does that mean? And what, where do we have to kind of make a distinction or where can, what can, how can we make this as generic as possible so it doesn't matter? Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the things I was going to ask about because back in the day, it was it's was pretty hard sometimes with IIS and all that to get those. Make sure you had the permissions to write to a file, right? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah that, um, backslashes versus forward slashes. There, I think there yeah. were a couple of early, um, uh, what's the word, the case sensitivity issues. Um, but, you know, pretty minor. Um, I think the most interesting thing of like, DOS blog expecting Windows was the time zone thing. Yes. Let me uh, stop sharing my screen as I'm going to have to jump off in a few minutes. But the time zone fix was a super interesting one, Mark. Yeah, that was fascinating. So um, originally, time zone was all connected to registries, right? So um, uh, to Windows registry. So buried in the Windows registry was information about the po all the possible time zone permutation and combinations. And you'd have to go check it, pull that into the app. Um, and I think it also had a backup, like a, I think the DOS blog also, just in case it couldn't find it, had a black backup of registry, uh, of sorry, of time zones that it could possibly grab. <laughs> and so from my perspective, I was like, well, what am I supposed to do when I go to Linux? There's no registry in that sense there. Um, so from that perspective, uh, so from that perspective, I would, um, we kind of leaned on the community and said, <laughs> Was that um, uh, Damien? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm gonna actually, I'm going to leave and I will send him the link and maybe he can jump in. Sure, yeah. that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so we, we didn't want to rely on the Windows registry. Um, we couldn't rely on the Windows registry. So we said, well, what? how is the um, community has fixed this? So there's a NuGet package out there. I think, oh, I forget the name of the gentleman who, uh, in fact, let me see if I can find it, the reference to it. Um, who has um, who has been who has provided kind of complete um, time zone help via a NuGet package? So this is one of those instances where, frankly, it just wasn't worth saving and preserving. And for projects that have lasted this long, you're kind of almost in this constant iteration of: is this thing that we've created worth preserving, or does it kind of cause us more? Is this a solved problem? So, yeah, we we were there before master pages, for example. For those of you who remember ASP.NET Web Forms, and so there was a version of master pages that the original Dust Blog had did. And so, you know, at some point, you say there's no point in us keeping and maintaining this, and. And time zones is one of those things that no the time. Thank you so much to, yeah, yeah, to Jimmy Scott. Sense. Thank you so much. That's exactly what it is. Um, um, thanks, Jim. Um, so yeah, that's exactly what it is. We kind of pulled that in and started using uh, using that to kind of help folks decide what time zone they were on. I still got a little bit of work to do with that, um, to be honest. But, <laughs> but, it, but at least it kind of divorced us from having to support and work, rely on Windows. It was a great journey. Well, it's funny what you're like when you talk about master pages. I still have such good memories of master pages <laughs> yeah. because when they arrived, it was a huge improvement. We had I was working on an, an ASP.NET one one site, and it was uh, it was really difficult. We had includes, and we had all kinds of yes. funky things to try and theme the site. And as soon as master pages came, it was like yes, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was revolutionary. So this, I mean, that was just so there was tons of things like that in in the original project that we had to find correlates for examples for in 
but the, the, like the modern ASP.NET. So we were using HTTP modules, which is kind of like, and HTTP handlers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were using um, web services via the ASMX to kind of submit blog posts, right? And yeah. we had to just, it essentially became, well, we have an API now, or, you know, we have these other constructs that make more sense in this context. So we were constantly kind of looking at what it, what can we do today that makes more sense in this context. And um, there, was a, there was a solution for everything really, um, uh, which was good. The thing that was actually the most complicated um, was understanding um, the synchronization context and um, how that changed. That was, so I, I, when I first started doing some of this work, we, it just started randomly, um, it would crash in certain instances. And that was because I was making assumptions about um, that were be I was being saved because of web forms and its way of essentially it didn't do things in parallel. It kind of queued them for you via the synchronization context. But um, ASP.NET um, Core was truly parallel, right? In, in in terms of the threads could all execute codes in parallel, and so shared resources would in fact be shared across those threads. Oh. And potentially that was web forms was saving you from a lot of things you didn't yeah. have to think about, right? And then yeah. SP.NET Core said, Yeah, you have to grow up a little bit here <laughs> and do <laughs> things in it. But you know, the speed benefits were through the roof. And mm -hmm. so that there was a kind of there's obviously a, a kind of give and take in that regard. It's interesting you're talking, you know, there's a lot of things that dot net is a uh, like C sharp is a language and dot net mm -hmm. is kind of what it does for you has stayed the same, but the underpinnings have changed a lot because yeah. going back like early on .NET, a lot of it was a wrapper over calm and it was like wrapping <laughs> windows internals yeah. yes. and all these things. And like you said, it was doing things for you magically, but it assumed yeah. there was a registry and it assumed yeah. apartment threading or whatever in the calm <laughs> objects and those sorts of gotcha. things. Right. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And then, you know, ultimately the, the, the speed benefit, frankly, was totally worth the, the additional level of control that you're expected to to kind of assume for though and i think that I, i'm assuming i have to speak to damien and others about the the kind of real reasons behind it but in terms of pure speed there was a noticeable difference day one um, when we went from like dotnet framework 4.x to dotnet core i think the first was 3.1 i believe the first official release was and then there was an additional bump when we went to dotnet 6 so um it's it's been it's been been fun to see that. Wow. Yeah. So you mentioned um, modules and handlers and yeah. it's a, it's an interesting thing. So if, if my memory's right, modules were sort of more like, um, oh, like, like your, um, gosh, and, and the words escaping me now, but the things in your startup CS or your middleware kind of, it's something that runs exactly. on every request. Yeah. And then handlers yeah. handled a specific like, URL endpoint, that, so they would handle a specific file type or something. Exactly. And, and I remember being kind of like in a corner where I was like, oh shoot, do I have to write a specific handler for this? And there were some things you could do, but then there was a lot where it's like, you need to write some hardcore C++ to like implement this stuff. And it was yes. like, yikes. <laughs> yeah, to be sure. So even modules, so there was modules also at the IIS level as well, which mm -hmm. were, I didn't. You went further than me if you went into that layer, to be sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I, 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 I think I stopped at the layer where um, your ASP.NET framework app um, needed to kind of process something on the way in, and essentially with the HT module, you can say, okay, I want to process it on the way in or on the way out, and it kind mm -hmm. of sat, as you said, in the kind of middle of a. a you could have multiple of these HTTP modules sitting in the pipe of your request response pipeline. Um, and 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 Dust Blog had its fair share of those um, dealing with security and dealing with various other things that we wanted to make sure were in our pipeline. And then, as you mentioned, the A ASMX endpoints, which were the HTTP handlers, mm -hmm. um, they were things like we needed to, okay, you've got Live Writer, you're constructing a blog post, and I need to submit that post to my to my site, and that handler would and handle that that endpoint for you, handle that request for you. And um, so from our perspective, as we move towards 
Dust Blog Core, we just basically used an API endpoint. It just made that kind that kind of stuff made way more sense in that context because we were moving towards, you know, APIs, MVC type scenarios. It was just it just made a lot more sense uh, the construct of that whole um, that whole that whole uh, workflow. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting thinking of that. That that was a whole like one-off solution back then that you would write like, oh, I need a handler for this. And like you're yeah. saying now, it's like, oh, of course, that's a REST endpoint. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. A lot exactly. simpler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, there, it's, it's amazing for me how over 15 years so much can change, but then you can also make very strategic decisions about what you stays the same. I don't know if I'm sharing right now. You're not yet. I was just going to ask if you're now you are. Okay, so let me um, collapse. Uh, let's see if I can collapse this, if you will. Uh, so, um, and yeah, your font okay. size in the Explorer is fine, but in the in the actual code is a little bit low. Okay, all right. Let me. Uh, actually, we're just going to deal with the Explorer for now. Okay. So, as I mentioned before, Dust Blog runtime is really the old stuff, like the stuff that Scott mentioned that was auto generated. The stuff we did with zip HTML. Some of this we no longer use, but there's a lot of this when it comes to saving categories and saving comments that are still actually very, very vital and very useful. So what we decided to do um, was essentially say, let's keep as much of this as possible, but let's decide how we want to handle it with all the modern stuff. So if you can think about this as the very bottom of the entire stack and the web front end as the top, what we wanted to be able to do was say, can we maintain as much as the runtime as possible and use essentially an abstraction layer, which is this manager's layer, to communicate to here. And then we can decide what we want to expose through the managers through to the web portion. So imagine uh, web is at the top. We speak to a manager from the web. We don't ever speak to the runtime portions that are really old from the web. We say, let the manager handle the, the whatever we have to do to convert this, to make it look reasonable for the, for the kind of, I like to keep, I'm one of those folks who like to keep the, uh, the, the actions as clean as possible, if I can. Yeah. Um, and the kind of I used the managers as an opportunity to kind of speak to the runtime in the way that it's used to and consistent. And then from the web perspective, um, we, we can do what we want. So we have controllers here um, and you have a classic. Um, let's look at the home controller. Uh, let's look here. And if that's too big, let's shift this out of the way. Zoom in a bit here. OK, so the index obviously is me just going ahead and looking at this blog manager and say, get me the front page post. Now, this actually, if you were to squint and compare this to the original ASP.NET web forms, there's a similar call that's being made. And if I go uh -huh. hit Control F11, I think I'm going to do that. What I wanted to do was Control F11, I believe. Let's go here. Um, so what essentially we've got is this blog manager, and then we go to the implementation of this, if I can, and it's going to ask me which implementation I want to go to. Ah, so here we are, and this is essentially, this data service is essentially, um, this the code below this layer is a, almost identical to the way it would have looked um, back in 2012. Uh, 12 or whatever it was. Wow. Um, this code is almost unchanged, right? So the manager says, I'm going to handle passing in all the data. And at this layer, the folks who worked at it back in 2004 would re absolutely recognize this. Um, in fact, the comments are still valid. And whoever put in hack AG at day one, it, that's actually pretty, pretty, pretty um, close to whatever it was back then. So, the, you know, so my, my point was, can we keep the, the, web looking like we anybody could come in and join the project at this point and it would just be an mvc essentially an mvc app an api mm -hmm. based app below then you're gonna have to talk to me if you want to make changes below the manager layer we're gonna have to have a really good discussion about that let me stop this accidentally started it. but you're gonna have to have a really good discussion about it below that but essentially the manager is the layer where we kind of um collapse both ideas from the modern to the old if that makes mm -hmm. sense that that um there's a lot of really good things what you're pointing out there one is that when i've talked to people as they're up to and when i've looked at our guidance too on how to update a, how to modernize an application the first step is kind of 
make sure that your existing application is factored as well as possible. So like right. take your web forms app and factor it. So your code is clean and you're using right. services and like you've got managers here and you've got your abstractions, right? And then your actual like UI specific code isn't that, there's not that much of it to update. Exactly. I think that's a, that's a really great point. I think the one thing that made this project absolutely successful across what is essentially almost 20 plus years is the fact that they had a very consistent approach to the way in which DOS blog was done. And so I could reliably sit another abstraction layer on top of that and say, I know exactly how it's going to respond when I do X, Y, and Z. And without that consistency, you're kind of asking for a lot of trouble. The other thing as well that they did, and again, this was 2005 and before, um, they had unit tests, right? So I could, I essentially was able to rewrite those unit tests again in a modern kind of framework and say, ah, these are the things that should always work. And pulling those together really gave me a lot of confidence that what I was doing was going to be re as reliable as the original. Do you, and are you able to include those unit tests then like in your automated build and that sort of Yeah, there's a subset of, 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 of the unit tests that are, that run as part of the automate every single automated build. Um, and then I have further, I have some that I do um, um, that are kind of more kind of test the kind of UI that I've kind of developed because there's obviously a lot of tag helpers as well. Mm. But yeah, but throughout the, every single build goes through the the the, um, the unit tests and that, that is a, obviously a confidence builder. Um, one thing I saw in your solution explorer was the um, DOS blog CLI. Ah, yes, that was yeah. me experimenting. So, um, yeah, so I do a lot of work to think about the way in which folks would interact with this. Um, um, so I think about, um, well, if I was setting this up for the first time, what kind of things would I want to update and change? So there's config settings that are um, important, that are pivotal, really. So understanding where I am hosting, for example, I need to know once I set up DustBlog, what the URL is that is being served from DOSBlock. So part of that is because, you know, with RSS feeds and things like that, I need to know the exact URL and I can't just assume that I'm coming in through a web page, which will self-reference kind of thing. So um, by having um, the CLI allows me to configure the XML files that I'm saving, um, allows me to kind of configure the project and um, I worked on the CLI because again, I wanted to kind of promote the idea that anybody can deploy it um, to any, you know, to Linux, to your own web host. Uh, and you can just jump to the CLI and say, I'm gonna set this up and I need to have these configuration files set just before I get going. Cool, okay. Wow, yeah, <laughs> there's, a, there's a, a lot of interesting stuff there. Um, let me see, I'm trying to think about, you mentioned things about making it easy for people to get involved. And um, do you have, like for people as they're looking at the GitHub repo, are there things for, you know, like first issues or ways that people can contribute there? Yeah, I think actually it's funny you should mention that. I think I just had my my last couple of first issues um, in here. In fact, I do have one um, around um, client-side caching. I think we miss I think I misunderstood, frankly, what client-side caching, how it would help me. <laughs> so I need this kind of changed. Um, so this is the kind of thing, if you're an ASP.NET developer, you are you haven't contributed to open source before, and you're looking for a friendly community, looking for somebody who will lend some, you know, you half an hour or an hour of time to kind of get you set up. And you want to look at a, a project and, and kind of submit for the first time. One of the things I'm most proud of, frankly, is the amount of first-time contributors that we've had to DOSBlog folks who have never contributed to a ASP.NET project and said, let me do that for the first time on GitHub with mine. Um, and so absolutely encourage that. Um, I'll, in fact, I'll make sure I submit a few more things that I know um, first time users would kind of be able to kind of dig into. Awesome, cool. Um, let me see, well, so normally, the show we start with community links and then towards and then we jump into the kind of overall like topic and presentation since Scott <laughs> had to jump out early we kind of flipped it around i can i have some community links if we're getting towards the end or did you have anything else you want to make sure to show or um gosh no i think that's about it i think um like, like you know just my last message is if if there's something in here that sparks a bit of creativity and you come join i like ideas i you know i like to 
bounce ideas about what things we should be doing next. Come with a couple of the problems we're trying to solve next are around um, how we make it easy for people to deploy and how you can create themes locally. So there's two things, I, two, two ideas here is, you know, obviously I've got somebody right now working on um, deploy to Azure button. So if you, within a click, I can deploy to Azure. Uh, um, so the other thing I want to work on is how I can create themes. So we've kind of tied ourselves into the bootstrapper idea theme. So um, how can you quickly design a theme locally and then deploy it to your own site and say, I'm going to switch to that theme now. So that's, those are the two things I'm really want to focus on in 2022. So if you if folks think they have ideas and want to share, please, please uh, join me. And the best way to just is file an issue on, on the repo or file an issue with ideas that you have things that you've tried and I'd love to um, kind of discuss it with you. Very cool. Okay. Well, I've got just a few com community links and, you know, please feel free to jump in with any thoughts. Um, they're pretty, sure. pretty uh, low key here. Um, so uh, I will share out the URL thing in the comments and for anyone else, they're up here and they'll also be in the show notes. So don't, don't worry. You can get to all these. Um, so uh, here's, here we go. First of all, um, just, included this. This is the, the repo we've been talking about. So this is DOS blog. Um, so there yeah, it is. There's FAQ, uh, read me. There's all kinds of stuff to get you, get you going. If you want to contribute even documentation, we'll have a read me, how I can get involved. Um, and yeah, happy to, to, I'm always looking for folks to join in. Well, that's a good looking code diagram there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. That is that from the, um, the generated from the GitHub thing? They had a, yeah, yeah, I think we, we, we wanted to try it out, see what it looked like. It's, um, nice. I love it. I love it. Cool. Um, okay, just a few interesting things. Um, people I'm working with have, have been uh, brainstorming some things recently with uh, minimal APIs. Um, so Chris Noring, um, he's, he's set up a thing to generate mock APIs from a JSON file. So the idea is you create a simple JSON file, and this is for prototyping, for working with other... Uh, teams, you want to just have something where it's a, a mock request um, or you know mock API you can set up. So given this, you can say here's here's my uh, you know products and here's here's some sample data, and then it creates the whole um, APIs around this. So get uh, put post delete all those sorts of things. Um, so uh, you know it goes through and shows the code for it. What I'm going to skip down to here is. The entire thing is like not very much code. So he he walks through in detail how he's um, setting it up, but the actual code for the thing is like pretty darn small. So here he's got this mock middleware, and that's kind of the magic of it. And it's just kind of going through and it's looking based on that JSON file. Uh, so and uh, link over to the repo. So. Absolutely love that. So kind of related in a way, uh, Jeff Fritz uh, pinged me this past week too. And he's like, hey, I got an idea looking at, what do you think of this? And he built the whole thing out. And so the idea is minimal APIs based on an EF context. So you basically point it at a context and it says, okay, you've got you know a contact and an address. Uh, let me build you REST endpoints around all of that. And so... Um, this is actually implemented as a NuGet package. And so you can drop this NuGet package into something and just point it at it and let it go. Um, so uh, so you can, if you want to play with it. Um, and, you know, there's, it was, it was interesting when he um, mentioned this on, on Twitter. Some people are like, wow, neat, sounds fun. And other people are like, this is terrible. You should never do this. And, you know, with anything, there's a place for, for different things, right? If you were building a, high scale, if you're building an enterprise application that's going to grow and be maintained over time, probably not a great idea. If you're building a very lightweight, hey, I've got, you know, a, a proof of concept or I've got a small thing, it almost reminds me of like dynamic data or that right. sort of thing, right? Where you're just kind of, uh, there's no business value in writing this, this code over and over, you know, so. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, just a few other, uh, you know, this announcement posts, if you haven't seen it, .NET 7 Preview 1, already out. So uh, this talks about where to get it, and then also talks about the, uh, you know, what the main themes are. Um, if you've been watching the 
the .NET community stand up. Hopefully not a huge amount of surprises because we, we do our best to kind of preview things and, and talk about where we're looking in the future. Um, but so, you know, of course, here's our, here's our kind of main fundamentals of things we're looking at for this. Um, and there's also, I, I'm guessing in here, there's a link to themes of .NET, but if not, there, that's uh, also where you I'll bring that up real quick. Themes of .NET. And this is, this is kind of where they look at, you know, like, okay, here's our, for instance, tooling, you know, and then you can go through, and this actually will link out directly to the GitHub issues. Um, so this, you know, the, the goal is to kind of plan these things in the open. And so we try not to surprise you with what we're thinking about. Um, and here is specific ASP.NET. Um, and we've gone through some of this stuff uh, recently, but this is uh, this is kind of the core pillars. Um, and then for ones that are kind of, I've pinged people directly. We're hopefully getting uh, James Newton King on soon to talk about gRPC. We've got some other Razor. We, I'm working with the team to get them on the show soon. But this is some of the things we're looking at. Um, one thing that is newer, we did have a show on this kind of recently, but Orleans, um, looking at kind of integrating Orleans more directly into .NET 7. So for my experience as a .NET developer, developer, it's always been kind of a neat thing I've kept an eye on, but I haven't used it heavily. And it's been sort of separate from the, the key sort of .NET, you know, deliverables and scenarios. And so it's neat to see this being more deeply integrated in. So. Um, then just, just for, uh, some, some kind of fun stuff, if you want to poke around at it, I, here's the ASP.NET on Wikipedia. And, um, I was just kind of thinking back over the 20 years, you know, looking at going back to 2002 with uh, one Oh, so, uh, wow. yeah, Mark, you said, I think you were starting in the, like right around two, one, one, two Oh. Yeah. 2000. Yeah. So I started personally in the 1.1 timeframe. Okay. And so that was around 2004, 2003. Um, and so I know for a fact that, so I'm seeing 2005 and 2.0, we were before themes. So themes weren't a thing. Master pages weren't a thing. Um, login controls weren't a thing and that we, we, we got, was in the project. So all of that was, yeah. was, was very much, um, was very much as something that needed to be created in order to kind of create dust plug so it was fascinating to see these things pulled in but frankly at that point i don't think there was much motivation to switch over to that to to you know too old to too old vernacular because we had a fully fleshed out solution oh, at that right. Point. Right. right so so i had to kind of make the leap past two oh past three oh and say okay four oh let's let's just get four oh in place and then we went, went to core of course so you like a lot of other people at that point had had to build some of these things. And I think the idea with 2.0 was to ship some of these things in the box. So yes. people I had to deal with theming and login controls and master pages and all these sorts. And I remember digging these things up on the blogs. People had their own master page implementations of, okay. And it wasn't NuGet back then. It was uh, get this zip file from that's, the source. That's a page. great point. So I think the I think the folder structure still exists in the DOS block core. I'm not sure if I removed it. Where you'd have a bin folder, right? Wouldn't you? Where you said, okay, these are the things, these are the assemblies I'm sharing with my project. And yeah. that kind of folder would sit there as kind of a, as a kind of poor, poor person's uh, nougat, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we would and you do it wrong file. and you just, everything breaks. Like you try and debug that and you're down in the GAC and you're in yeah. the like, machine yeah. config and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, just, uh, so I included this if you want to kind of, especially for some of the old timers, if you want to look through and take a trip down memory lane. One other thing that was just kind of fun for me is I was looking back at the ASP.NET homepage over time and, you know, going back to the web archive. <laughs> Excellent. So yeah, we've got you know, the, and it, it's fun with this to see some of the um, some of the features and things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also interesting to watch the web design change over the years. <laughs> you know, that is the, neat. I don't know the big search up in the corner, the you know different uh, different sort of layouts and, and things. Yeah, so. I I just remember hanging on to every word and every article from this particular location. You know, 
Um, back then, there were only a few people blogging. Um, you know, at that that were at Microsoft that were blogging mm -hmm. externally as well. So you'd have to come here. And these days, it's fairly normal. We have a whole kind of teams <laughs> who yeah. are blogging these days and talking about the stuff they're working on. And there was only a few back then. And uh, Scott Goob was probably one of the earlier ones who was kind of blogging about the stuff he was developing. So this was kind of um, uh, industry shifting. So it was, it was pretty cool. Yep. Yeah, it's funny too, as I'm noticing this, it's, it's a little hard to see, but it's uh, this is ASP.NET default.ASPX question mark tab index equals zero and tab ID equals one. <laughs> so that was nice. the beautiful URLs we had yes, back in the day. Yes. And then here, this is a little bit, you know, nicer of it. You can tell we had a redesign. This was a, around, to, so 2010, I had just started at Microsoft and you mentioned Scott Guthrie blogging. Mm -hmm. And I actually like helped work on the ASP.NET site more on the kind of content and what's going in. And we had, uh, I think, monthly calls with Scott Guthrie where he'd be like, hey, I think, you know, it's looking around and you can't really find info on whatever. And so, yeah. And Neat. then, uh, yeah, just a couple more updating a little bit more here. This is, uh, um, oh gosh, uh, the date, so 2012. And then, uh, you know, getting closer, this is 2013 yeah. or 2014. Um, so, and of course, now if you search for um, for ASP.NET, it'll redirect you over to the .NET website. So cool. I just thought that was fun stuff. That is cool. <laughs> so cool. All right. Well, we have coming up, we have the Visual Studio Toolbox. And I believe they're at, oops, live.net. They're either at 11, 11.30. I think 11.30 Pacific. Yeah, 11.30, and they're talking about what's new in, in Visual Studio 17.1. So stick around for that. And thanks again, Mark, for your time. This was really cool. My pleasure. Thanks for, the, thanks for inviting me. All right. Bye. See you.